All right, we're back with another edition of the New York Sports Rapid Rundown, the final episode in the month of July. And we're headed to the dog days of summer where things are heating up for the Big Apple baseball teams with the trade deadline approaching next week. Now, this week on the Rapid Rundown, as we discuss the three hottest sports topics of the week, I have a unique guest. Now, it's not very often that you get to interview your former boss, but today... I have the chance to do just that. Joining me in studio is a radio play-by-play voice for the Knicks with ESPN Radio 98.7 FM here in New York. He's also a host on that radio station. He's the first man that gave me an opportunity to report at a TV network. He is the legendary former sports director of News 12 Brooklyn and the Bronx, the one and only. Pat O'Keefe. That's what a, quite an introduction there. We go way back to our yeah. days with uh, News 12 The Bronx and News 12 Brooklyn, yep. and it's, uh, it's great to reconnect with you here in the studio. No, man. Good to, good to have you here. Like I said, always appreciative of the opportunity you gave me, and I'm glad to have you here on the New York Sports Rapid Rundown. Awesome. You know, I mean, is it the busiest time of year for sports? No, no. but there's always so much going on. Um, we have two baseball teams heading in opposite directions, <sighs> and there's never really a slow time or a dead time in sports in this town, which is great. No, which is why we have the show. We get to talk <laughs> about some hot topics, and that's always good. So, Pat, you just mentioned it. It's another intriguing week in New York sports. We saw a head coach that you know very well, get an extension. The Mets, they completed a season series sweep of the Yankees. They're looking towards the trade deadline. But first, speaking of the Yankees, Mm -hmm. we're going to start with them. A lot of people have feelings on the Yankees right now. We're going to find out what Pat feels about that. Pat, the Bronx Mm Bombers' struggles continue this week, swept by their crosstown rivals, Mm -hmm. the New York Mets. And for me, it's interesting because not long ago, they looked like they were the best team in baseball. But this midseason swoon is continuing. We've seen collapses from the Yankees before. So the question for me is simple. Are we witnessing another collapse by the Yankees here? No, I think we're well into another collapse and then some. And it feels like it was just the other day that, as you said, they were, you know, the best team in baseball. It was a very long time ago that they were the best team in baseball. You got to go back to Father's Day, uh, June 16th, when they lost at Fenway Park to the Red Sox. And that kind of started this month plus long swoon that they have been on during that time they're the second worst team in all of major league baseball luis severino the mets pitcher who caught a little bit of flack over the past week for doing nothing but telling the absolute truth he said it as well as anyone this lineup is consisting of two players right now they have three above average players arguably on the entire roster if you count garrett cole who is also coming off a shaky start there are holes There are leaks up and down this roster, and there really don't seem to be any answers right now. I mean, what are the answers? Can Alex Verdugo start playing better? Can Glaber Torres start playing better? Can Anthony Volpe start playing better? Aaron Judge and Juan Soto are doing their jobs. You can't expect anything more from either of those two players reasonably. Judge is having... The greatest season of what is already shaping up to be a great career for him. And Juan Soto is as dangerous as any hitter in Major League Baseball outside of Aaron Judge. And despite the Herculean efforts of both of those players, this is a team right now that cannot figure out a way to win baseball games. In fact, they seem to figure out a different way to lose each and every game. It feels like that. It looks like that. Talk to Yankee fans. Yankee fans are not happy right now when I talk to Yankee fans, Pat. They're really upset. Should do you feel like it's legitimate, their anger that we're seeing from them right now? And should that anger be directed to Aaron Boone, the manager, or is it Brian Cashman? Who should the anger be directed to right now if you're a Yankee fan? Look, I think the anger has to go all the way up. I think there is something fundamentally flawed with this organization, and there has been for quite some time. Does Aaron Boone get on his players enough when they don't hustle or they make mental lapses? No, I don't think that he does. Has Aaron Boone historically made anybody on his roster better? No, I haven't seen a long track record of that. Has Brian Cashman built a flawed roster with too many holes to count despite one of the highest payrolls in Major League Baseball? Yes, he absolutely has. But what sorts of constraints are placed upon Brian Cashman doing his job from Hal Steinbrenner? Uh, It's a new economic model throughout Major League Baseball. They can't go out and spend like they used to in years past without penalties of luxury tax, etc. That being said, 
there is a far greater emphasis on keeping the salary, keeping the payroll under control. And there's nothing wrong with that if done correctly. Tampa Bay has kept their payroll under control for years. They've contended. Cleveland has done the same thing. They've contended, and they're contending this year. Even the Braves, who historically over the last decade have been one of the best teams in Major League Baseball, they haven't overspent, but they've built their rosters correctly. It's hard to say, let's keep the payroll under control, and then on the other hand, you're paying John Carlos Stanton, who can only give you half a season over $30 million. You're paying D.J. LeMahieu, who can't hit 180. You're paying him $15 million. Uh, on and on, on this roster, there are bad contracts, there are holes, it leads to a lack of flexibility. And like I said, I think all the names that you mentioned, Dexter, are at fault. Boone and Cashman and ownership, Hal Steinbrenner. This is overall top to bottom a fundamentally flawed organization right now. And by the way, you say that the Yankee fans are frustrated. Yeah. Should they be frustrated? They should because here's, here's the scary part. It's only going to get worse. Uh -oh. Right, look uh -oh. at this. You, you, there's a very good chance you don't have Juan Soto next year. But see, that, that's the fear right there, Pat, for, for the Yankee fans. Okay, you're right in everything you said. The anger can be justified for the Yankee fans here. But there are going to be some optimistic Yankee fans, Pat. And they're going to be optimistic about the trade deadline coming on Tuesday. So you talked about this roster having a bunch of holes, a plethora of holes, and something being fundamentally wrong with them. Is there anything the Yankees can do at this trade deadline to improve this team and get them back to looking like they did in the first 70 games of the season? Or is it a wrap and this is just going to get worse from you? It's not a wrap because they're two games out of first place. They're still holding on to the first wild card spot in the American League. That being said, the fourth place wild card team in the AL, the Red Sox, they're not that far behind the Yankees. So there's a realistic scenario if this continues that the Yankees don't make the playoffs at all this year. That is now realistic, which would be unfathomable when they were 50 and 22. Right. As far as the trade deadline goes, there's so many holes to plug that it's not even worth getting into specific names. I mean, if you look at the lineup right now, what positions are you comfortable with? You're comfortable with Judge, obviously. You're comfortable with Soto. Um, I think Anthony Volpe at shortstop is going to continue to get better. I think you know, you'd like to see a little bit more, but what you're getting from him is fine. Same thing with Austin Wells, your young catcher. That's it, right? We got a hole at first base. We got a hole at third base. We got a hole in left field with Verdugo. We got a hole in center field with Trent Grisham. So the hope is that, and I've said this for weeks now on my shows on uh, ESPN New York, 98.7 FM, the hope is that the unholy trinity, if you will, of Anthony Volpe, Alex Verdugo, and Glaber Torres, two of those three guys have to step up, turn their seasons around, and start once again producing like they were earlier in the season. Uh, number two, you need Giancarlo Stanton to not only come back, but in recent history, when Stanton has come back, he has not been productive when he comes back. So he not only needs to come back, but he needs to be as productive as he was before he got injured. Now, that brings us to the trade deadline. That's, it sounds to me, when I hear a lot of that, it sounds from Pat that you're hoping that for the Yankees, or they should be hoping that a lot of the improvement that can help them is internal has to be. more than external. It has to be. They have players. On, they're not going to break the bank. First of all, they gave up a lot to bring in Juan Soto. That's true. They gave up a lot of capital. It was a roll of the dice, one that I agreed with and still do. Look how good he has been. You don't have a lot left to trade at this deadline for the amount of holes that you have. So a part of turning the season around has to come from within. But are there other moves you can make? Sure. You can plug a couple of those holes. Third base right now is a complete dead zone. And so is first base. And I know you're missing Anthony Rizzo, but he wasn't even that good. He was better than you're getting from first base now. But he wasn't even that good before he got injured. And then there is just no confidence. We haven't spoken about this, Dexter. There's no confidence in the back end of the bullpen again right. Clay Holmes last night blows the save in Fenway Park when he's coming out of the bullpen in a tight game like that what Yankee fan has confidence Clay Holmes came to the Yankees at the trade deadline in 2021 there were no expectations they didn't pay a lot for him he overperformed what they thought he could be 
and a year later he landed in the closer's role. He is a very fine pitcher in the major leagues, but to hold this role, closer of the New York Yankees, I just don't think that's a role he's equipped to hold right now, and he's unfortunately, especially in recent weeks, proving that time and time again. Yeah, and I wonder about where the Yankees are really going from here past this trade deadline because you mentioned how great Juan Soto has been, how great Aaron Judge has been. It feels almost like they are wasting mm -hmm. these great seasons from these guys. And you said it. There's some truth to what Luis Ferrino said. There's a lot of truth. In terms of they only have two good hitters. <laughs> it seemed like a shot. It was kind of, kind of joking. But if they waste these good seasons, last thing I'll say on the Yankees here, if they waste these good seasons, Pat, from Aaron Judge, historic season. Juan Soto, who's playing well. If they waste these, you think Juan Soto is gone? Because that's the nightmare scenario for the Yankees, that Juan Soto could be out of here with these guys playing so well. I don't think, to be honest with you, that Juan Soto returning to the Yankees hinges a ton on how the team does this year. I think it's going to come down to money at the end of the day. Um, the Yankees are going to make every effort they can to be in the arena to make him uh, the best possible offer that they can. I, and considering what they've already given up for him and what he has proven to be for their team, I fully expect that to be their plan of action in the offseason. So I don't think his return or possible return is going to hinge a lot on how they do for the rest of the season. But you're absolutely right. They're wasting the prime years of Aaron Judge's career. Over, yeah. Think about it. Over the last three years, when he had the 62 home runs, I know he was injured a lot of last year. And what he's doing this year, he's actually better this year than the 62 home run year of 2022. But what do they have to show for it? Not, not anything right now, no. other than, as we've been talking about, some unhappy Yankee <laughs> fans. That's the, that's the situation right now. All right, the Yankees, I hope things get better for their fans. But we'll see what they do at the deadline. As for the New York Mets, the vibes, they're good right now. Very different from the Yankees. The team, they won all four games against the Yankees. So feeling good about that. They've won five games in a row. It's really hot right now. They played the first two games of a four-game series with the Braves. Won those first two games. And now, they're all alone in first place in the National League wildcard spot. When you look at this Mets turnaround, because for me, this season has been crazy. And I think the Mets fans will look at that. At the center of it has been Francisco Lindor. And he's been playing really well. Should Lindor be in the conversation for National League MVP? If he continues to play at this rate, I definitely think he's going to continue to be in the conversation. He is right now, as far as war goes, which is, you know, that catch-all stat that kind of tries to take everything into consideration, who is the most valuable player to their team. He has the highest war in the National League since late May, which is when they turned this season around. So he's been fantastic. The other part of Lindor is, let's not forget, when they had that players only meeting after getting swept by the Dodgers in late May when they were 22 and 33 Lindor really stepped forward and was the spokesman for the team and I've spoken about this meeting in the line of demarcation if you will for this season a lot of times and a lot of times those players only meetings can go several different ways this is the best possible scenario and Lindor has been the face of that not only did he like I said show his place in the clubhouse and his leadership on this team, but he went out and backed it up by playing his best baseball since he's become a New York Met, and in turn, the team has followed suit, and this is turning out to be such a delightful season for the Mets because sometimes the best seasons are the ones that are successful but did not start with high expectations, and that's exactly what this has been right now for the Mets, and it keeps getting better by the day. Yeah, it continues to get better. Mets fans, unlike the Yankee fans, really happy. Seem like they are trending in the right way. Now, the Mets, they could also make some moves mm -hmm. by Tuesday's deadline. What should the Metropolitans do to improve this roster as they try to make a playoff push? Bullpen help. Um, and Matone has been a good addition to the Mets bullpen so far, giving them some much-needed depth and some innings. But I still think they need definitely one and probably two more arms in the bullpen. I have heard some people say that maybe they could use another bat in their lineup. I don't think that – I mean, you could always use another bat, but if you're limited in what you can go after, I don't think that should be a high priority for this team. I think the Mets 1 through 9 – have one of the deepest and most balanced lineups in all of Major League Baseball, especially now that you're getting the kind of production you are from Jeff McNeil in right field. That was kind of the one weak link on the roster. He's come out of the All-Star break on fire. So a couple of arms in the bullpen, and I do think 
that they need at least one more arm to add some depth to the starting rotation. The lineup is, like I said, the lineup is what's going to carry this team. It's what has carried this team so far. As far as the starting rotation goes, you need the starting staff to keep teams in games with the benefit of a above-average offense. And from the bullpen, the expectation, honestly, is don't blow games because they still have the potential to do that. Yeah, we'll see what David Stearns and company does to try to bolster this team's roster as they move towards a playoff push. But like I said, if you're a Mets fan, the vibes are really good right now. All right, got to talk some Knicks basketball. The New York Knicks head coach Tom Thibodeau, they agreed to a three-year extension on Wednesday. And you look at this, Pat. Tibbs is now on pace to be the longest tenured head coach for the Knicks since the legendary Red Holzman. Now, look, you know this. You've covered sports in this town for a long time and the Knicks. Knicks fans have been critical of the head coach over his time leading the Knickerbockers here. But I got to ask you this. Was extending Tibbs the right move for this franchise? Is he the right guy to lead this team going forward, especially when you look at how successful he's been with the team over the last couple of seasons? It was a no-brainer, and frankly, I'm surprised it took this long, but they were obviously busy making other moves to fortify their roster in the offseason. If you look at this four-year era, uh, this post-pandemic era for the Knicks, during which they've gone to the playoffs three out of four years, it's essentially ever since Leon Rose took over as team president in March of 2020. And you can look at different reasons why the Knicks are where they are right now. But the most important reason, the one decision that set everything else in motion that has followed after was the hiring of Tom Thibodeau as head coach. I know most people will say Jalen Brunson has been the most important addition, and yet he is for obvious reasons. But does Brunson come here if Tom Thibodeau doesn't get here first and set this franchise on the right path? Think about where the Knicks were before Tom Thibodeau got here. They had just fired David Fisdale after he had started the 2019-2020 season 4-18 and after he had gone 17-65 and the year before. They were being run by an interim head coach, Mike Miller. Then the pandemic hit. The season was suspended. When it resumed, there were seven NBA teams that were not invited to participate in the bubble in Orlando and the Knicks were one of them. But during that time, they made this vitally important decision of hiring Tom Thibodeau as their head coach, and things just fell into place from there. First and foremost, he turned Julius Randle, who always had potential, into an all-star, into an all-NBA player. And in his first year, Thibodeau's, the Knicks were a playoff team, a half step back, well, a full step back in his second season as the personnel didn't exactly match his coaching style. And then, of course, leading into year three was the biggest acquisition of all, and that was bringing Jalen Brunson in, which was the next big piece to really turn this franchise around. I think that's an amazing point in that Brunson isn't here if Thibodeau was not here. And obviously there's some familial connection, as Mm -hmm. most fans know, with all of that. But the value of Thibodeau has been undeniable with the Knicks thus far. Now, Pat, as somebody who is the radio play-by-play voice of the Knicks, calling many games this past season and during the postseason, You've seen the growth of the franchise this past few years. Where do you view this Knicks squad heading into next season? Are they legit contenders for an NBA championship? They're contenders. That's a tough question. That's why I paused. They're contenders to get to the NBA final, sure. Boston still, even without Chris Stapp's Porzingis playing for maybe the first half of next season, Boston is still well ahead of the pack in the Eastern Conference. But if you're listing the next group of teams, I think the Knicks are on top of that group, but it's tight. The 76ers were already talented, and they've been very active this offseason. They're right there with the Knicks. And a team in the Eastern Conference that I frankly think a lot of people are overlooking because they had such a tough year last year and bowed out in the first round of the playoffs, the Milwaukee Bucks. They're going to have a second year with Damian Lillard. Giannis Antetokounmpo did not play in the playoffs. You got a full season under Doc Rivers. Now, Doc Rivers has had his problems in the postseason throughout his career. But as far as being a regular season coach, he's been one of the best in history. So I think the Bucks have kind of been cast aside a little bit. I think you have the Celtics well ahead of the field and then a group of the Knicks, the 76ers, and the Bucks. I would give the Knicks, because of their balance, because of their uh, wing versatility with Mikel Bridges and OG Ananobi, 
because obviously of Jalen Brunson and because of their head coach, Tom Thibodeau, I would give the Knicks the biggest edge in that grouping. So yeah, they're certainly a contender to go to the Eastern Conference Finals. And let's be honest, if they don't get there this year, Dexter, I think fans and people are going to start to be disappointed because the last two years, great runs into the second round. But let's be honest at what happened. Each of those two years against the Heat last year, against the Pacers this year, the Knicks did have home court advantage in the second round and lost both of those series. Now, there were extenuating circumstances for both. Last year, Miami did get hot. Julius Randle wasn't 100%. The Knicks, you know, just kind of getting there after not having been that far in the playoffs for so long, there was a sense of playing with house money. This year, the injuries just kept piling up. But at a certain point, the expectation is going to be to get beyond the second round into the conference finals. And with what they've done this offseason, bringing in Bridges, re-signing Brunson, extending Tom Thibodeau, re-signing OG Ananobi, I think we're at that point now where those are the expectations. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. This season, the expectations are going to go up. I think for a lot of people, it will be Eastern Conference Finals or bust. And you're right, there will be some disappointment if the Knicks don't do that. But listen, I like that. I think they're primed to be contenders. What do you say? To get to the NBA Finals. Right? Yeah, they're to contenders to get there, sure. To get there, sure. Well, you know what we hope? We hope that we are able to hear Pat calling those games in the NBA Finals. That, that's what we want. want to hear. Or maybe you get to do the call when they win the championship. That will be really good. We that would that. be. Yes. We, 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 I would agree with that. We need that. I think we need that. <laughs> All right, Pat. Here's what we got to do. We saw the Olympics start this week, mm -hmm. so I wanted to do some Olympic talk. We've been doing some videos on the Olympics, so we had to do a bonus question mm -hmm. about the Olympics. Now, look. I love the Summer Olympics. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love watching it. And there's always debates about who's the greatest player in any sport. You know, you see this all the time in what we do in sports. So my question to you is, who is your GOAT Olympian and why is he or she at the top of your list? It's such a difficult question. You know, when you talk about other sports, who's the GOAT in football or baseball, the biggest roadblock is it's so difficult to compare different players from different eras. Now you still have to do that, but then you have to add in different sports as well. So how do you compare a swimmer to a track star? It's very difficult. For me in my lifetime, the two names that top my list, I'm going to put Michael Phelps number one, just for the sheer volume of winning that he did. The fact that he had individual record-breaking performances in back-to-back -back Olympics, 2004 in Athens, and then he came back 2008 in Beijing and was even better than he had been. The sheer volume of winning that he did and over the period of time that he did it, for me, puts him on top of my list. And this is just in my lifetime, by the way. Carl Lewis, though, was an incredible Olympian. And it's very difficult to compare swimming and track and field because in track and field, you're just not presented with the amount of opportunities to win medals. There were only a certain number of events that Carl Lewis could win a gold medal in, and he won gold medals in all of them, the 4 by 100 meter relay, the 100-meter dash, the long jump, and the 200-meter dash. For Michael Phelps, it was twice that amount of events that he could enter just because of the nature of their sports. But Carl Lewis, with his nine career gold medals, was as good a career Olympian I think, as you could find. But for Michael Phelps, just the numbers are staggering. 28 career medals, 23 career gold medals. He actually competed in the Olympics in 2000 when they were in Sydney as a 15-year-old. He didn't medal then, but that set the stage for what he did in 04 and 08 and 2012. And for me, it's very hard to take Michael Phelps off the top of that Olympian mountain. No, it's really hard. The numbers are staggering. I sometimes wonder, and I was hearing you say that, if people forget about the greatness of Carl Lewis, right? They think about him as a sprinter. They forget he won in the long jump and won a gold medal there. In 96, by the way, when yes. he was kind of past his peak yes. in Atlanta, in his home country. So think about that. He won the four gold medals in 84 in Los Angeles, his yep. home country. And then he bookended that by winning the long jump in 96 in Atlanta. And you're right. In that point, he was looked at past his prime mm -hmm. there. There's, there's a lot of great names you could talk about in terms of Olympians, right? There's, you know, Mark Spitz. Yep. You could talk about Jackie Jordan Kersey. There, there's so many great players that you could talk about. And it's just, it's amazing. I don't know how you separate uh, swimming and track. That's hard for me, too, because I think you made a fantastic point in that track and field you have, especially if you're a sprinter. Yes. Right. And most people are in a dis discipline of long distance running or, or sprinting, and you don't have that many There's a finite amount of opportunities. How excited are you for the Olympics this year to, to watch it and, and see who maybe is the next 
great Olympic athlete here. How excited are you for these summer games? Yeah, I'm like you. I'm a big Olympics guy and always have been my entire life. So thrilled that they're here. Uh, I have a daughter who's a big swimmer, so nice. looking forward to watching those events with her. Also, the especially the U.S. men's basketball team. Now, the U.S. women's basketball team is fun in their own right, but they're a little more dominant. Not that there's anything wrong with dominance. Eight, eight straight gold medals. Exactly right, mm -hmm. and it really hasn't been close. Uh, the men's team, obviously the favorite to win, um, but I think they're going to be pushed. So it's going to be interesting when push comes to shove to see if they can get across the finish line with those gold medals around their necks. Yeah, it's, it's not 92 anymore, no. guys. <laughs> it, the world has gotten better in basketball. I'm in, I think it's more exciting when they're pushed. I do too. I, don't know, I think it's more exciting to see that if these guys can get over the top yep. and get another gold medal. The men, they're going for their fifth straight. You heard Pat talk about the women. They're going for their eighth straight. Should be really fun. I'm excited. The Olympics are excited. I'm excited yeah. to see who's the next star or great Olympian. And maybe if someday somebody on the swimming side pushes Michael Phelps, gets to his numbers. I don't know if we'll see that anytime soon. Katie Ledecky on the women's side is very impressive as well, too. That is Pat O'Keefe, the great play-by-play -play voice <laughs> on the radio side for the New York Knicks. You can also catch him on ESPN Radio 98.7. Pat. As I said, it is not often you get a boss or former boss <laughs> that you get to interview here. So thank you for coming and joining me on the New York Sports Rapper Rundown. Anytime. I appreciate you extending the invitation and uh, glad to see you doing so well. Appreciate it, man. We're going to have to have you back up here to talk more again and hopefully not uh, annoy Yankee fans because I'm sure <laughs> they're not thrilled about what you had to say. But they needed the truth. They needed the truth. That's Pat O'Keefe. We will see you guys next week on the New York Sports Rapper Rundown.